Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we especially thank you for bringing Dr. Kuntz to us safely to present to us about the mission of your church. We pray that this time which we have together may be a benefit for us unto everlasting life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll just introduce him real quick, and then he can just kind of take over from there. Uh, Dr. Kuntz is one of the professors of exegetical theology at the seminary. He's actually a classmate of mine, and uh, he's doing some good things there at the seminary. But one of the things that he's especially passionate about, and the reason I brought him out here today, is talking about mission and church planting and all that sort of stuff. So that's what he's here to talk about, and, um, and please help me welcome him. So, Good morning, and thank you for coming out for what I understand is an unusual time for adults to be reading the Bible. I guess the kids always have Sunday school at this time, but this is unusual for the adults, so I thank you for being here. Um, Pastor Heidi mentioned that I am interested in mission and church planting, so uh, I'll give you a head start on the Bible. Go to Matthew 13, and while you're going there, I'll fill time. Matthew 13 is where we're going to start, and we're starting there because we want to link up what we're talking about now with what we're going to talk about in the sermon today. I became interested in mission right away because I was not raised in church. So uh, when I became a Christian, which was in college, uh, and I didn't become Missouri Synod at first because I grew up in Pennsylvania. That's very far away from here. Uh, and uh, there are no Missouri Synod churches, practically speaking. Um, when I became a Christian, I immediately thought, I have to tell other people about this. I was going to a college where almost nobody was a Christian, and so I would tell other people about Jesus. Most of them thought it was very, very silly, but some of them listened. Uh, but I distinctly remember a guy next door to me in, in the dorm in my senior year of college, and he said I shouldn't be allowed to use electricity since I didn't believe in evolution. <laughs> so very hostile uh, and not very kind. And uh, so in that environment, I became very interested in spreading Christianity because it was so unknown to pretty much everyone around me. Um, by that time, I was a Lutheran. I had discovered the Lutheran church, um, and I thank God for that. But I also found that at that congregation, which was very small, where I met my wife, who is from Minnesota, um, we were the only two people under the age of probably 60 in that church, but it worked out, right? So it was good. Um, uh, in that church, they weren't sure how to spread the gospel. They weren't sure how to go back to a different time when more people went to church. It was a church that had maybe 40 folks on a Sunday, and, um, but they remembered a time within maybe 25 years where they had had 200 on a Sunday, multiple services. They always had a vicar from one of the seminaries uh, learning how to be a pastor. It was kind of a big operation. And pretty much everybody who was there except my wife and myself could remember that. And they said, how do we go back to that? What do we do? Because that was great. That was nice. How do we do that? And I think that that's one of the more difficult things about spreading the Lord's word right now in America is that many of us can remember a time when things were seemingly much healthier. Certainly, we can remember a time when Christianity was not something that people were laughing at publicly. They would never do that. Nobody would ever get elected and do that. Now it's very different. The dynamics of God's kingdom, how God's kingdom works, which is what we're focusing on now. In the sermon, we're going to talk about other things, and I don't want to you know, use all my powder right now, but it's going to be different. But the dynamics, how does God's kingdom work, doesn't actually change over time. It's always been the same. And that's a comfort, because this is just kind of to start out, no matter what we're looking at in the future, and we don't know what we're looking at in the future. I think we know that now. 2020 has proven to us we don't know what we're looking at in the future. 
Uh, there are lots of things that are completely different than I thought they would be at the beginning of this calendar year. No matter what happens in the future, God's kingdom still spreads and grows in the same way. Okay, regardless. And it's not actually too hard to figure out, right? Jesus actually explains it. So let me go into Matthew 13. We'll read a little bit. We'll explain a little bit. And then we'll kind of open it up for any anything that you guys want to talk about. We're also, after Matthew, going to go into Acts because we want to look at who's the main character. But let's start in Matthew 13. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 to start out. So remember that Jesus has already sent his disciples out in Matthew chapter 10. That was sort of their, their, their practice, right? He's going to send them out. They're going to preach his word. They're going to cast out unclean spirits. He already sent them out. They've come back and they're saying it didn't work quite like we thought it was going to work. Like when we tried to do what you do, it didn't work the way we thought. So now Matthew 13 comes in. This is Jesus's explanation. He says this, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And when you sit down, you're teaching. It's it's completely different from how we do it, right? I'm standing because I'm teaching. You're sitting. It would be opposite in Jesus time. So when whenever he's teaching, he's going to sit down. He does it for the Sermon on the Mount, too. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. You know this story. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. I don't know how you feel about birds, but in the Bible, they're usually kind of evil. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I love birds, but in the Bible, they're always sort of evil. They're there to eat, I mean, They're kind of like vultures always, and they're eating up things that shouldn't be eaten. So some eat the seed. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. He's going to explain this in a second, but just watch a couple things to start. One is God's kingdom doesn't work in the way that you might say, I'm going to do this project and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to set it up this way. I figure out all the materials I need. I do the project and then the project's done. So God's kingdom works more like I have to rely on God to give the growth. Pastors are compared to different things in scripture, shepherds, but here they're compared to somebody who's engaged in farming and there are no seed drills. There's no technology. There's nothing to help you. You just have seed and soil and water and sun. That's all you got. And you're only in control of One of those things. Because notice he didn't say, and the sower got the soil ready and some of the soil was really good and others he used a certain amount of compost or something and he he built some raised beds in his garden. He doesn't get to prepare the soil. The sower doesn't get to decide, the church doesn't get to decide how accepting the people who hear the message are going to be. I just read a book. It was it was a mem- memoirs of a really uh, interesting, very strange man. Uh, he was a Norwegian uh, Lutheran pastor, and he was a pastor in rural Iowa in the 1950s. And there was a guy that would come to their circuit meetings, the, the meetings of pastors, and he would always complain about, uh, oh, nobody comes to my church, and nobody wants to listen to me, and it's because I'm in a dying town. Okay, and uh, he. Re- You know, the writer reports that that this pastor is saying this. And he says, he says, that's all baloney. It was the 1950s. Everybody went to church. (laughs) Okay, And I don't know whether or not that's true. But what he's saying is there are different times when it seems easier to grow what God's word grows in people than others. And 
I don't have control over that. Whether I'm a pastor, whether I'm a church member, I don't have any control over that. I don't control the weather. I don't control weather or geography. I can sow soil. I can sow seed. I can decide when I'm going to go out and whether or not I'm going to work hard at sowing, but I have no control over whether it's going to rain or whether things are going to be scorched or how deep the soil is. I actually have no control over that. And that takes, I think, some of the the pressure off. Because when we're thinking about evangelism, speaking the gospel to people, whether those are folks in our family or folks in the community, whatever it might be, understand that you have no control over anything except the fact of whether or not you are speaking the gospel. That's it. That's all there is. Now, whether or not you're diligent in doing that is one thing, right? You know the difference between a farmer who works hard and a farmer who doesn't. There is a difference there. And that is in the guy's control. He can either get up or not. You know, Proverbs talks about this. Proverbs talks about the guy who, when it's time for sowing or it's time for harvesting, he's sitting in his bed and he's, the image that Solomon gives you is he folds his hands and rolls over again. <laughs> Right. So he knows there's work out there. He knows there's a lot to do out there. But he says, I want to keep sleeping a little bit and then we're going to have a nice breakfast. and Then maybe we'll get out there. You know, so you do have control over your effort, but you don't have control over the climate or the weather or any of that. And that's actually OK. The good news is you never did. Jesus doesn't even say I have control over the climate and the weather. He says a sower went out to sow. The emphasis is on whether or not you're getting out there, not what kind of results you're going to get. Okay. Does that make sense? Or do you want to ask or say anything, comment uh, before we we go on? I'm here for you folks, not for myself. So uh, anything that you want to discuss? Off the bat. No. And I'm a, I'm kind of a, I'm a stranger. So I, if you don't want to talk, that's, that's totally fine too. I understand. Uh, my kids, I have, I have six kids. I'm crazy. Uh, I have six kids. And, uh, if they meet anyone new, they don't want to talk. <laughs> but, uh, when they're with me, all they do is talk, 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 talk. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to skip over. There's going to, Jesus is going to explain what parables are for. Um, we're not going to worry about that today. We're going to skip to his explanation, which is chapter 13, verse 18 is where he starts that. Okay. And, uh, when, when he gets there, you're going to see that he's not explaining how the kingdom works to everybody. So what I'm teaching you guys this morning, what we're looking at this morning, what we're focusing on in the sermon is not stuff that we have to explain to somebody who is an unbeliever, who has kind of fallen away from church. Jesus uses different teachings for different people. So to the disciples, he'll say, this is how the kingdom works. You have control over where the seed goes. You don't have control over how it grows. But he doesn't explain that to, say, the Canaanite woman in chapter 15, because she doesn't she doesn't know any of that. She doesn't understand any of that. She just has a child who is sick, and he helps her with that. So when we're talking about mission or evangelism, it's wonderful and uh we had some very excited children in the Heidi household last night about the mission festival. You guys do this every year. Uh, John, he was kind of yelling and he was like, it's the mission festival. You know, he's very excited. It's great that you guys do this. This is great for a church to focus on what the church needs to focus on. Because when the disciples come back from their first mission, Uh, Jesus doesn't explain to everybody how it's been working, but he does explain to them. So let's take a look at that. Verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown Along the path. So he's going to go through the parts of the story the way he originally told it. And notice that the one where it's snatched up, eaten by those nasty birds, the word has been sown in his heart. 
So Jesus doesn't say, oh, this guy only got, he went to vacation Bible school once, so he doesn't really understand or remember the gospel. Okay? So see the amount of effort that is going in here. The guy does understand. It has reached his heart. Your heart is not just a place where you feel in the Bible. It's kind of the deepest part of you. So in the deepest part of you, you got, you understood what the person was saying, right? Now you might not have agreed with it, but you, you got it. You understood. And so this is not just kind of a passing acquaintance. So for instance, I didn't grow up in church, but I grew up in America. I grew up in Appalachia. I knew that Jesus, that people said Jesus is the savior. I knew that people, I didn't believe it, but I knew that people said that. Right. So that kind of just head knowledge is not quite what he's saying here. This is a person who heard the message and understood how it actually would impact his life, which I didn't. Right. But he got it. And then he said, "Mm, no, thanks. No, thanks. So there's something it's a little deeper than just, oh, he heard about Jesus once. You know, Um, it's a little deeper than that. So verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. It's just, I love it. It's just great. You know, I can't get enough of this. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So this is an interesting thing. So the plant is growing quickly, and sometimes that can be its own problem. It's growing quickly. It comes up. It looks good, you know. But then there's something weak there. And Jesus explains it as he doesn't have a root. So there's not enough going on underneath where people can't see that has been developing enough so that if something comes and harms the plant, there's a lot, there's too much wind or there's, there's, a, there's an unexpected frost, whatever, that the, that the plant will survive. There's not enough underneath. This is a fascinating way for Jesus to talk about what faith is like. What does it look like when there's faith in somebody? Well, there's, there's some, there's things you can see, right? Is the, is the person, uh, where Christ is gathered with his people in the church, right? Is he in church? Uh, does he know how to pray? Kind of simple things. But Jesus is saying there's a lot underneath for anybody. And is the stuff that's going on underneath that you don't necessarily see or the person doesn't, I mean, we don't, we don't require when you walk in the door of the church, Tell me about kind of the deep things going on in your life right now and what you're thinking. I mean, we don't do that. And that that's good. That would be kind of weird. But Jesus is saying, if you don't have a sense of that, or if you can't understand life in terms of Christ and his kingdom, then it's going to be a problem when Christ and his kingdom become something that people don't like. Because you watch, you saw what happened. It's a little weak. There's not a whole lot going on underneath. And then something comes and it's tribulation or persecution on account of the word. Now, there's some cost to being a Christian. There's some cost. And this guy says, I don't want to pay that. So notice that he sprang up immediately, but he also fell away immediately. Shallow. Okay. Okay. So we've got, nope, didn't understand it. We've got shallow. What else? Verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. Okay. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So the plant was there, but it didn't bear fruit. And why? Okay. Two causes. So this is not, it could have a little better soil, a uh, better root structure, right? But what's the problem? The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. And I like this one because it explains a lot of what I have just observed. 
And that is that often people don't necessarily just straight up say, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. I don't, you know what, pastor, I'm leaving the church. I never had this happen to me. No one ever came and said, I just can't agree with the Nicene Creed anymore. You know, I'm just sick of saying that thing. And I don't like what it says. And I'm out of here because of the Nicene Creed. That's not really how it works. It's usually more subtle than that. And it takes longer time than that. And it's not usually something like, I don't, like, you know, I don't, I don't like what you're teaching about, uh, how faith happens or something. Because cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches involve me being too busy with other stuff and too invested in something else. And that's what I find to be most often an issue. Not that the person says, no, I, I, I don't believe that God exists or I don't believe that Jesus is really God or something, but that these things kind of work together. That is, I have a lot of other stuff going on and I just don't have enough time in life to think about my soul or, or forgiveness or any of the things that the church actually talks about and that God's word addresses. So it's not so much that all of a sudden one day people just said, no, we hate the Trinity, but they did get really busy. It's not so much that they said, hey, we uh, we don't like that there are two natures in Christ. He's got a divine nature and a human nature. They didn't show up on Trinity Sunday and get angry about that. They got really busy with sports and going here and there and doing this and that, the cares of this world. And then in addition to that, He says deceitfulness of riches. This is an interesting perspective, but he has this when he uses the story about the guy, the the dishonest steward, the unjust steward, the dishonest manager, where he realizes that he's going to get fired. So he makes friends with all these other guys so that when he gets fired, he's got another job lined up. Smart guy. Okay. Not that that's that's an easy story to understand. He's just being smart about what's going to happen. Okay. Um, They, what's happening with deceitfulness is that they don't understand what's going to go away. So it could be, it it could be a straight conflict between I'm trying to make money and churches getting in the way of that in some way. But it's really, it's really a little bit deeper than that. They don't understand what's going to go away. So they haven't had time, probably because they're too busy. They've never stopped and thought, when I'm on my deathbed, what are the things that I'm never going to say, I wasted my time doing this? If I'm going to be dead one day, which is true for everybody, and I look back and I think, what am I, am I going to say, man, I, I spent too much time with my kids. I was with my children too much. I wish I had spent more time at work. I don't think anyone ever says that. So the thing about riches is not that they're evil in and of themselves. It's that we don't, we fallen human beings don't know how to use them well because they, they confuse us and they trick us. We're not smart enough to use them well. Deceitfulness. It means that when I look at it, I think that it's a goal in itself, that having more money or this amount of money or this amount of land or whatever my goal is, that that's enough in itself. So that's what I'm going after. And Jesus says, that's going to trick you because here's the thing about riches. Go all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount. The thing about riches is that you can't take them with you. <laughs> and even if you save them up, moth and rust, because it's all coinage, they don't have a cash shortage, right? Uh, you know, they're not going to make you use your debit card. Um Moth and rust are going to corrupt and destroy all that stuff that you built up. And it's not going to be worth to you on your dying day what you thought it was. So I like that. That third one I find to be very, very common, especially in our churches today. That's probably, that's much more common than they say, no, I flat out reject this or that. Um, Flat out reject this or that usually seems to happen. And this is why campus ministry is, I think, very important. As long as people are still going to college, I don't know if that's going to be, I don't know what's going to be going on in 10 years, but as long as they're still going to college, that is the place where they are taught to flat out reject. 
probably most clearly. I mean, sometimes it happens before that, but uh, I, I, my, my doctoral degree is from a public university. I know what my, I mean, uh, I, I taught a class called Intro to the Bible in graduate school. And uh, there were um, a bunch of Christians in there, and they were very nervous about me on the first day. They don't know anything about me except my name. They don't know I'm, a, I'm a, an ordained Lutheran minister, this kind of thing. So they're kind of, I could tell that Christians were sort of hostile. So they took the class because they kind of know it. But they were kind of hostile because they figured I was going to try to de- destroy their faith in the class. Now, why did they think that? They knew from experience <laughs> that they had had with other classes, right? So um, let's listen to the, the last one, and then we'll stop. And anything that we want to reflect on before we go into Acts. Do we have services at 1030? Correct. Yeah. So, so probably want to go about 15. 15. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So verse 23, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. So let me just qualify with this, and then we'll kind of bridge over to Acts. When you think about these numbers, they vary from person to person. They're also harvest numbers. It's what you count when you're done with the work. That's when you can count, right? That time isn't here yet. Jesus is going to tell another story in a second about the wheat and the tares or the wheat and the weeds. When do you get to tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds in that story? At the end of time. So this is also a fascinating thing because the fruit that people's lives, that their Christian lives are bearing isn't even known, I think, in some cases, a hundred years after their death. How much does it matter that someone did something in 1906 that was an amazing witness to his family? Maybe the effects of that are still continuing down to this day. So I think when you think about this idea of bearing fruit, which is what a Christian does, Don't limit it to, well, this is how it's worked out in my life or in my ministry or whatever it is. You don't even know how much impact you're having on people. And even when you die and people reflect on, boy, I'm really glad that, you know, dad spent so much time with us. I'm glad he never said I, I, you know, I'm spending too much time with my kids. You don't even know what kind of impact that has on people. You have no idea. In a really good way. You have truly no idea because you're not in control of the process. The word is sown and then it bears fruit. Amazing, right? Um, I'm going to go over to Acts. We're going to start in, we're going to go into chapter six and just look at a few things in Acts. As we do that, do you have questions? Do you have comments as we're, we're flipping over? Okay. All right. So let's look at Acts chapter 6, verse 4. So this is the stuff before Stephen is martyred. Okay. Acts 6, verse 4. What's going on is that, um, you know, they're having having, uh, basically uh, kind of a a very tense voters' assembly. I'm I'm translating here, right? I don't know if they actually had a... But they're having a tense church meeting uh, because some of them don't speak the same language as the others. Um, that's that's what's going on. Everybody's Jewish, uh, probably, but some of them speak Greek. So those are called in chapter one, the Hellenists. And some of them speak probably Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. And they're called Hebrews in verse one. Um, but what's happening is all of these meetings, 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 meetings are kind of distracting the apostles. The apostles don't have time to preach because they're going to the meeting where the Greeks and the Aramaic speakers are yelling at each other. (laughs) Okay, so here's their answer. And remember, the 12 now in verse two includes Matthias. He's been added. So it's back up to 12 after Judas's departure Uh, in verse two. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, so this is everybody. It's a all hands on deck meeting. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. That is, we're, we're cleaning up after things and we're 
serving the food that they give to the, the different widows. But what do they say they're supposed to be doing? Preaching the word of God. Verse three, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So other things have to happen in the church and be managed well by people that both have God's spirit and are wise. That means not only that they know what the right thing is, but they also know how to do it. Proverbs type stuff. And they say, pick those guys out. Verse four, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So as the apostles are describing what is the ministry doing, the ministers of God are praying and they're preaching. These are the major things. And not, not just inside the church service preaching, but they are generally spreading the Lord's word. You can see that the apostles understand the major thing that has to go on in the church is that the word gets out more and more and more. Right. That's why it's so great that you guys have a mission festival, because if the church doesn't exist to carry out Jesus's mission, what does the church exist for? Is it to have meetings? I mean, I've been to church meetings that I like and I've been to church meetings that I didn't like. I've never heard teaching on the Bible that I wasn't interested in. The whole thing is so that the word can be spread. What I want you to do is go forward to chapter 12. So we're skipping over quite a bit. We're not, we're not finding out everything that happens in Acts. But in chapter 12, we're looking at verse 24. Let me explain a couple of things that have happened in the meantime. Because if you look at the book of Acts, it's probably the best description of how God's mission is carried out in the church. Very clear. And there's lots of different famous characters in there, including uh, one of my favorites, Paul. So between chapter 6 and chapter the end of chapter 12, going into 13, you've had Paul's conversion. You've had Peter uh, converting Cornelius the centurion. You've had a lot of things happening. That's great. One of the things when I've asked this question is people are very confused Who then in Luke's story is the main character? Who's the main character in the book of Acts? A Sunday school answer would probably be good. Paul, any other guesses? Jesus. Jesus. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's not, that's not maybe totally far off. Look at 12 verse 24. So all of this has happened. And Luke says in 12 verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Now that's going to come up several other times. Chapter 13 verse 49. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. And now let me read 19 verse 20. So this is just before kind of the back end of Acts is really about uh, Paul's journey to Rome by an, an indirect route. 19 verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. The main character here is actually, despite what it looks like, the word of the Lord. It's not even Paul. As much as I personally would want it to be, it's not Paul. It's the word of the Lord. Uh, This is a good illustration that I have right behind me of this because you have pictures of lots of people. Uh, You knew them. I do not. And knowing nothing about them, all that I can really observe about them. Did anyone know Pastor Bartz? Was that too long ago? Okay. All that I can observe about them is that uh, the church is still here and you have a mission festival and that it's here. So this idea of who the main character is, is actually pretty important. It's important not just for the pastor to understand what's his role in somebody's life who was baptized, let's say, 60 years ago by some completely different pastor, probably in a different place. What's his role in this person's life here and now? Maybe he won't bury that person. 
it keeps the pastor, keeps things in perspective for him. But I think for everybody, it keeps everything in perspective. Because what it means is that the kingdom is not actually about the individual people who are doing the work. They are necessary, but it's never the main part of the story, even when the story gets really exciting. So after 19, after the last time that Luke says the word of the Lord prevailed and increased mightily, there's going to be a really exciting story about a shipwreck. You, you, you probably know that one. Because Paul is going to go by very strange ways. Eventually, he's going to get to Rome. And then the word of the Lord will have reached the center of the empire that they all live in. It's a really big deal. It would be like saying, boy, we have a really great Missouri Synod Church in downtown Washington, D.C. Is that true or false? That's actually, that's false. (laughs) And maybe that's good. I don't know. (laughs) But but, uh, we don't, right? We don't have a church at the the heart of, uh, you know, this enormous country. So uh, when you think about that, it keeps in perspective, okay, how does, how does the kingdom work and what is my role in it? Even if I'm Paul, my role is still as a sower. And when you think about this, this is certainly true for the apostles and it's true for pastors today, but it's also true for everybody. It's just that your realm in which you're sowing might be bigger or smaller. If you're an apostle, the area where you can sow the Lord's word is basically anywhere you want to go. If you're a parish pastor, it's a smaller area. But if you're a person that, let's say, runs a business and you have a lot of contact with other people, then it's the people that you have contact with. If you are on your own in your business or uh, you work at a place where, you know, my, my dad is a machinist, so he can't even hear anybody else, basically. He's not going to be, uh, you know, preaching the gospel to them uh, during work. If you have a job like that, then the people that you can have impact on is going to be different. But whatever, however big your circle is, and that changes at different parts of life, because sometimes in life you're very, very busy. You see a lot of people, you're very involved in things. Other times you're not. Uh, however big that area is, that's where you can sow. And the impact that you have, I think, is completely unpredictable. So um, I grew up in a rural area, and we had um, something called, it wasn't called release time. That's usually what it's called in the Midwest. It was called church school. Um, And I think it was constitutional. I don't know. Nobody complained about it. And uh, so across the street from the elementary school was this, it looked like a little church and it had been built by all the churches in town. And uh, it was a, it was a special class, sort of like gym or art class. And uh, once in a while there was a Jehovah's witness that didn't go to it, but basically everybody went. And in church school, you would learn church things. It was kind of like going to Sunday school, but I didn't know that because we didn't do anything like that. We didn't go anywhere on Sunday. So but I would go there and we, I, I, I still have the Bible. I have all these stickers because I have a good memory. So I was an outstanding student, even though I wasn't a Christian. <laughs> so I, at the time, so I, I had stickers for memorizing the Old Testament and the New Testament, et cetera. Okay. The lady that taught me the Lord's Prayer doesn't probably know who I am or what happened to me. Um, but she has had a very big impact on my life. She doesn't know that. I don't know where she is. I don't know what happened to her. And she had a pretty small, I mean, she was having an impact on second graders. That was her realm. Okay. Now that makes a pretty big difference. Uh, because when I finally had time, when faced with uh, a lot of confusing things that I was learning in college, when I had time to start to think about what, you know, why, why are certain people doing this with their life and other people are doing this with their life? Why do people do different things? And what do I think about all that? The only place that I turned to was Christ because I didn't know any different because I had been taught by this lady in second grade and third grade and fourth grade, and then it was over. She had taught me things about Jesus, Mrs. Hainick, that I, at the time, I was in one ear and out the other. You know what I mean? It was just like any other class for me. It was like art class. You know, uh, I've, I, I have not gone to have an art career and I'm not a professional athlete. So gym class didn't work that well either. But, at, but eventually it took. 
And she doesn't know that. And this is the way with the kingdom, because you, you just have no idea what exactly what you say and what you do and how you are in Christ's name will actually do. And that's a wonderful thing. Now, I think that was always true. I think that it was a little easier maybe in the past if church attendance was more normal or uh, if, uh, you know, we didn't have, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the government. We don't know what the government's going to say or do or require. It was a little easier to predict, okay, this is my field and this is the kind of work that I have to do in this field. But it was always the case that we had no control over the growth. And so there is one thing that you actually need to know uh, in order for the kingdom to spread, and that is God's word. If you know that, you're perfectly equipped, right? There's a passage that we use a lot with the seminarians um, in order to talk about how to build sermons, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, which you probably know the first half of it, at least, which is all scripture is inspired or all scripture is God-breathed is what the Greek says. All scripture is God breathed and second half profitable for teaching, correction, reproof and training in righteousness. And it says the last part that the man of God may be perfectly equipped, perfectly equipped. You're going to have everything you need if you have and know God's word. If you don't, then it doesn't matter what programs or any kind of special stuff you have. It doesn't matter. That stuff could be useful and it could not be useful. It could be helpful. It could be harmful. What you absolutely need is God's word. And if you have that, if you know that, if you believe that, then you don't really need anything else. And that's great. That's really great. Um, that's cheap. So we don't have to have a church meeting uh, to decide how much money we're going to spend on it because uh, it's not that hard. We have plenty of Bibles available. Uh, and it's really the only thing that impacts the heart. Because when you're talking about mission, what you're really aiming for is the heart. You're aiming for the deepest part of the person. And you're saying at the deepest level of your life, what's really important is that you trust in Christ. Everything else could change at the deepest level of your life. What you really need is to trust in Christ for salvation. That's what we're going to be talking about in the sermon from Romans 10. So um, we're going to stop right now. I'm going to pray in a second. But if you want to take a look, in, we're going to be looking at in the sermon Romans 10, because Paul wants to say, what is this whole thing about and how do we do it? What is the most essential thing? What is the church for? And he's going to say it's for Christ to be proclaimed. Let's pray and then I'll let you guys go. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the folks here. Uh, I thank you for their presence, for their willingness, uh, for their love. And I thank you especially for the love that they have for you and for each other. I ask that you would root and renew them in Christ's love, that they may grow deep roots, uh, not only in this place, but especially in your word, so that knowing your word, they may flourish and bear abundant fruit. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks a lot, folks.